Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India If John Dan is the chief of the metaphysical poetry school, George Herbert is a chief follower of this metaphysical school of poetry. He was a good friend of John Dan. We will see the historical context and literary context which shaped the poetry of George Herbert. Actually, George Herbert became seriously interested in a concept called shape poetry. He took care to print his poems in certain shapes about which he wrote poems. For example, Easter wings and the altar. In this lecture, we will spend more time with his well known poem, The Caller. We will analyze it using linguistic and rhetorical strategies and then finally, offer a nautical reading that is some knowledge of this sailing marine travel we will use for understanding this poem the caller. The historical context of George Herbert and Dan and others is really interesting for us now to know many things that happened. It was a time of persecution of the Puritans a group of Puritans called the Pilgrim Fathers went to America in 1620 with that shape called Mayflower. We have the change of monarchy in 1625. The new changed government became anti-parliament that means, the King Charles I did not care for the members of the House of Commons or the House of Lords. It led to the civil wars including the Bishop Wars that is the source of the battle is religious freedom and also democratic aspiration of the people. One of the reasons for unrest among Protestants is this Archbishop of Canterbury from 1633 to 45 called William Lord. He was aggressive in promoting Catholic rites and rituals including visual symbols in churches across England. He was also instrumental in forcing Scotland to follow this Roman Catholic practices, but people did not like and so the bishops this bishop William Lord and the king were executed in 1645 and 1649 respectively. It is quite interesting to see Magdalen Herbert, Herbert's mother, a patron of scholars and poets including John Dan. John Dan was able to to some extent survive much more happily than George Herbert. Herbert and many others were writing devotional poetry at this time. Some of these poems are called emblems. Two writers of this time promoted this poem called emblem poetry. Francis Qualls in England and Jacob Katz, a Dutch poet, they were responsible for popularizing this emblem poetry at this time. Johnson that is Ben Johnson and John Den were also popular at the court. But we have two other metaphysical poets George Herbert and Henry Vaughan. They are from this Welsh background that is they are Catholic poets and they did not have much ch chance to grow in this predominantly Protestant society or even later at this uh, time of the commonwealth. George Herbert was educated in Cambridge University. He was a friend and admirer of John Dunn. He became a member of parliament 
from one constituency called Montgomery, but then he was disillusioned with the worldly life after some making some attempts to join the mainstream. Just before three years of his death, he got this chance to become a rector at Bemerton, a rural area far away from the city life. George Herbert was noted for the kind of intense spiritual conflicts which we will see later in Hopkins. Herbert's poem, The Temple, was published posthumously after his death. Herbert influenced Vaughan, Crusher, and many other poets of his time. His chief contribution is to this pictorial printing of the altar and Easter wings and many other poems in his book, The Temple. The poem that we have chosen for discussion is The Collar. Let us let's see this poem now. As an example of shape poetry, we have Easter wings. We need not read this. Our interest is to show you how the poem is shaped like wings. The next poem is the altar. The altar as we have in a church is presented to us. The poem deals with the altar and it is printed or the shape of altar is brought into the poem itself. Now, we can move on to the poem for study now. This poem has a number of lines in, in one group. We have divided this poem into several sections for the sake of our discussion for our reading. Section 1 or the poet cries, I struck the board and cried, no more I will abroad, what shall I ever sigh and pine? My lines and life are free, free as a road. Loose as a wind and large as stone, shall I be still in suit? Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me bled and not restore? What I have lost with cordial fruit? Sure, there was my, sure there was wine. Before my sighs did dry it, there was corn. Before my tears did drown it. Section 2. Is the year only lost to me? Have I no base to crown it? No flowers, no garlands gay, all blasted, all wasted. Not so, my heart, but there is fruit, and thou hast hands. Recover all thy sigh blown age on double pleasures. Leave thy cold dispute of what is fit or, and not. Forsake thy cage, thy rope of sands, which pity thoughts have made and made to thee good cable to enforce and draw and be thy law. While thou didst wink and wouldst not see. Section 3. Away, take heed, I will abroad, call in thy death's head there, tie up thy fears, he that forbears to suit and serve his need, deserve his Lord. But as I raved and grew more fears and wild at every word, methought I heard one calling, child, and I replied, my Lord. The caller is a poem of 36 lines with three sections we have divided for our sake for discussion. We have some leading questions which will enable us to understand the poem and appreciate it. What is a pun intended in the title, the caller? Why does the speaker cry out? Why does the speaker feel free and yet constrained? Why does he think about the fruit? What severe loss does this speaker feel? There is something which is troubling the speaker. How does he assert his own will? Where does the voice come from? And finally, how does a poem move from rejection that is rebellion to acceptance that is obedience saying, my Lord. We have a thematic contrast between two major ideas in this poem. The poet is actually in conflict, conflict between faith and doubt. Should he follow the path of God or should he follow the path of the world? 
should he have his freedom or be constrained by the scriptural or church practices? Should he rebel against God and follow his own ways of life or obey God and serve God? What happens to a person when he is frustrated? There is no question of joy at all, but then at the end an element of fulfillment comes when the anger of the poet subsides and then he accepts God. This is a poem that deals with the relationship between man and God. We have several shades, several levels of our relationship with God. A number of poetic devices can be found in this poem as well. Irony is chief one. At the beginning, the poet rebels against God, but then at the end, he accepts. He need not have rebelled against God at all, but then his heart did not allow him to keep quiet. He feels constrained by the collar, the chain. He feels chained to one particular way of life that is Christian way of life. He wants to be free. We have the symbol of cage restraining the freedom of people in 17th century and that is well indicated through this collar as well. The metaphor of collar, harvest, cage all play together to convey that if you are confined to religious way of life, you will not be able to have or enjoy the fruits of material world. So, he asks a rhetorical question, shall I be still in suit and confine myself, avoid all the pleasures of life? He says no at the beginning, but then later on he accepts through these similes free as the road. He considers himself free, he considers himself loose as the wind, as large as store. Why should he be confined to this church and one particular way of life. We have a pun on this word collar, collar, collar is that which we have used in a dress and also the collar that is used to chain animals. We have again a pun on fruit, fruit the, e, the result the result of life, the fruit of worldly life and the fruit of spiritual life. The paradox is well exemplified through rope of science. How do you build a rope of science? How do you have freedom in a confined society? That is the question George Herbert asks, finally he accepts. When we come to rhyme, rhythm and meter, we notice that the rhyme is variable. However, we can find some pattern for example, in words like wild, child, word, lord. The rhythm of this poem is jerky, we do not find this rhythm slow gradual movement. There are irregular line lengths like 4 syllables, 6 syllables, 8 syllables and 10 syllables indicating the conflict experienced by the poet. In line number 14, we have 7 syllables. The example is, have I no base to crown it? In line number 16, we have 3 syllables, all wasted. So, up and down movement or probably something like the waves coming to the shore and going into the sea. We have a rapid discarded movement from first line to the last line that is 1 to 36. This rapid movement of lines, the conflicting experiences, emotions expressed by the poet all indicate a movement from a state of restlessness to a state of rest at the end. The meter is iambic, but then we have different line lengths, so die tri, treta and pet, pentameter we have that is 2 feet, 
3 feet, 4 feet and 5 feet we have in this poem. On the whole Herbert's poem The Caller presents to us a frustrated speaker crying out expressing his anger against God. This anger can be found through the insistent questions that he asks throughout the poem. The speaker thinks he has freedom and he can assert himself and reap the fruit of his labor, living his life. The irregular rhyme and lines indicate the speaker's quest for freedom restlessly. He builds up a faith in himself as against faith in God and gets ready to go out to the world and enjoy the benefits of the world. As he cries out, raves, he hears a voice saying, child and then the poet replies, my lord. So, paradoxically we find the wild child, the whining child melting into a mild sweet child without needing words at the end keeping quiet becoming pacified. An interesting nautical reading we have for this particular poem. If you want to know more about it, you can read the article by Levitt and Johnson. The whole poem is about the speaker's wish for a worldly voyage. He wants to go out to the world and enjoy himself. So, throughout the poem we have nautical or marine or sailing images. It begins with the collar. Collar we said is the dress that could prevent the person from moving out of the church. But in the context of this sailing, it is said collar refers to a principle of the main mast. Next we have board, it is not only striking the board or a table, it is the deck of the vessel that is a ship. Road here is not, is not just one road that can take you anywhere in the context of sailing. Road is an offshore anchorage where a ship can be harbored for a while. Store is not just a worldly store in the context of nautical reading, we have a ship's storehouse. Similarly, suit need not refer to dress alone, it can refer to a spread of canvas, a suit of sails which govern the movement of the ship. Base can refer to ports where ships can stay. Garlands also can refer to a wreath of ribbons festooning whaling ships. So, the whole context of this poem is sailing that is what Levitt and Johnson argue and then proceed further. The hands refer to the crew members of the ship. Similarly, cage can mean a beacon to the harbor signaling a navigable channel. Rope of sands also could indicate the boundaries of the land. Away play with meaning can refer to raising the ship, raising the ship's anchor for setting sail. The last one death's head can indicate the kind of fear that can prompt, but also exchange it for a banner that is showing we are ready to go. Thus we see the collar is a poem of spiritual storm and also calm. We can notice two ways of life, one is the way of the world, another is the way of the church, one is action, another is contemplation. The poet is drawn towards action, that is where he feels the conflict with his own way, with his own life of contemplation. In summary, we can recall that the historical and literary context 
in which George Herbert was writing that is devotional poetry or shape or emblem poetry enabled him to write poems using certain shapes like wings in Easter wings or altar in the altar. The caller also deals with a spiritual experience, a spiritual conflict and this is contrasted with sailing into the world though that world is not free from conflicts at all. Thus, a nautical reading of the poem tells us the poet's interest in traveling out into the world or sailing out into the world, but we have to realize that whatever way we may, we may choose each world has its own problems if we accept and choose to live life as it is then it is fine for George Herbert the poet. Thank you. We have some references as I said you could read the article by Levitt and Johnston from this journal studies in philology and enjoy the fruits of the nautical reading. Thank you.